and I'm happier in my current job than Jonathan Kaminga is apparently. <laughs> so yeah, okay. Jonathan Kaminga. So let's let's talk about this. So the Warriors last night they lose in pretty crushing fashion. They're up in with like six minutes left in the game and the Nuggets go on this furious comeback ending in a Nikola Jokic. How would I describe this? Running fadeaway 37 footer that he banks in off the glass. So just normal Nikola Jokic stuff, basically. He drills this shot and it seems like just all hell breaks loose. Jonathan Kaminga is the big piece of this. So Kaminga goes for 16 in the first 18 minutes that he played. He played his normal 18 minute rotation up until the six minute mark of the third quarter. Steve Kerr pulls him out after an and one bucket to get to his 16 points. Kerr at the time. So at the time of that, the Warriors are down 85 to 84. Kerr does not bring Jonathan Kaminga back because typically his rotation at that point would be to come back at like the five or six minute mark of the fourth quarter. Well, the Warriors are winning by 18 points at that time in the game. So Steve Kerr is like, well, we've got it rolling. Wiggins has it rolling. We're not going to bring him back. Problem is it fucked up. Because they lost and went on a terrible run. And now Jonathan Kaminga has, uh, or at least Jonathan Kaminga, like the people around Jonathan Kaminga, whoever Shams' sources are in this. Someone named sources. Yeah. Somebody named sources here uh, has gone to Shams. So, per an article on The Athletic, what a great website uh, from Shams Sharani and Anthony Slater. After sitting the final 18 minutes of Thursday night's loss to the Denver Nuggets, Golden State Warriors forward Jonathan Kaminga has lost faith in coach Steve Kerr and the 2021 lottery pick no longer believes Steve Kerr will allow him to reach his full potential. Sources close to Kaminga tell The Athletic, adding another layer of turbulence to an already complex Warriors season. Uh, Per one of those sources, Thursday night, was the straw that broke the camel's back. Okay, so this is a complicated deal, and I have like a lot of thoughts on this. I will just kind of give you the floor first. What When you saw this, like what was your reaction? I think that it's been very interesting because it's like this is the the melting pot of all of the difficult things about the, the Warriors over the past few years. It's something that amazingly was still like a point of consternation or like a stress or tension point. They still won a championship doing so like multiple timelines, all that kind of stuff. And it seems that, you know, Kerr and the front office and all this kind of stuff, they're trying to maintain like the old guard, you know, appease them, even placate to some degree, right. At the cost of minutes and development, you know, potentially of the younger guys who seems like they can play. And yeah. it's not super easy to toe that line. Like, I don't think Kerr is in an easy position at all because you, if you do want to move off of Wiggins or it's Kevon Looney or whoever else is playing like a bunch of minutes and maybe needs to play less and there's other people who need to play more, you're like devaluing the ability to move on from them in the future. And they have the big contracts and like there's a whole bunch of roster construction considerations here. And I don't really know how they tell it, but I do think Jonathan Kaminga is right that these decisions, he's paying the price for them. So are the Warriors for the record, but not playing the guys who seem like have an easier path to impact, not playing guys who seem like they have an easier path to, you know, development if they do play. And Kaminga, who I've liked for a really long time and I think is a really unique play style next to a bunch of shooters especially with that explosive athleticism being able to shade with his movement he opens up some vertical paths to the rim and stuff like that and also on a a warriors team that the reason why wiggins was such a big deal is like if you stunted against the warriors maybe they wouldn't drive it all the way and it's like 
Kuminga is a guy, he'll test the stunt. He'll break yeah. the back line of the defense. And that's a super important aspect of like offense is don't let guys stunt all the time. Test the stunt. He's like a really interesting inflection point of everything that's going on dramatically with the Warriors right now. I stand with Jonathan, even even if I think it's a bit odd that he went right after the game. It's cr it's crazy. Like that's the piece of this that's absolutely fucking crazy. This dude, they lose by eighteen, or they lose after being up eighteen, and not twenty four hours later, there's an article in the publication that I work for saying, "Hey man, I got no faith in this coach." <laughs> that's crazy. That's crazy. So. I agree with you on your point about like creating rim pressure, particularly off of stunts, forcing teams into very uncomfortable situations, particularly in regard to having to guard more area on the court essentially yeah. is the issue. I think that where Steve Kerr struggles with Kaminga is the decision-making once he gets into the paint, right? Sure. Like Steve Kerr is very much an unselfish uh, pass first kind of coach who wants guys to make the right decision. And I'm not saying Kaminga is like a bad decision maker. He's just not a great passer yet to this point. He is a really good finisher. Uh, he can finish around the basket at a really high level for a wing. The problem is I think that Kerr gets a little bit frustrated from time to time with what decision making is. Kaminga brings a lot of energy and athleticism on defense. He you know, will not always be in the right spot because he's so young. He's what still 21, I think, right? Uh, yeah, just turned 21 in October. So I think that that piece of it creates a lot of tension. I also think that he's at this fascinating intersection of differing priorities across the NBA on the player side and on the team side and on the, uh, younger player side to the veteran side, right? That That's like a critical, critical part of this. And part of this is brought on by what the Warriors have chosen to do over this little run, drafting guys like James Wiseman, Moses Moody, Jonathan Kaminga, Brandon Pajemski, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? And not using those picks to try and accentuate the quote unquote dynasty, whatever you want to call it, that they had. It's going to, as you said, create natural tension between the rookies and the vets in some way. And I'm sure that some guys get past that. I'm sure that some guys move on. I'm not saying specifically in a lot of cases, but what I will say is like over the summer, there was like quite a bit of reporting, you know, part of it out of Draymond's mouth talking about how Jonathan Kuminga in like Draymond Green, for instance, did not really have any relationship. Like Monty Poole went on the radio in San Francisco and said like Jonathan Kaminga and Draymond Green, like don't have a relationship. Uh, Draymond Green like talked about like how it was not the easiest thing in the world for him as like a vet to try and like get to some of these kids. And like, you know, I think he brought up Kaminga like specifically when he went on Paul George's show. So that's where I think this becomes even more interesting because how much of this is on Jonathan, you know, potentially entering, having expectations, top seven pick, guy that was a top three recruit in his recruiting class, has been told he's going to be an NBA star for many, many years. How much of this is on Steve Kerr, who I think has mismanaged the young players on this roster, to be completely transparent. I think he should be getting more minutes for Moses Moody. I think he should be getting more minutes consistently for Kaminga. I think he should have been doing that the last couple of years, uh, finding ways to get those guys on the court in some way. And I, I think that Bob Myers deserves a decent amount of, not, not question here, because he brought them, what, four titles? But I think that trying to in the Lakeubs on some level, because the Lakeubs were very vocal about this, trying to squ like hit the middle of this all where they were trying to set themselves up for the future, as well as have these veterans that are clinging on to the past and what they were able to accomplish. That decision to cling on to the past brought them a title again, 
right? So you can't sit here and say it was a bad plan by any stretch of the imagination. But I think that you can question the efficacy of trying to hit this middle ground because it's really fucking hard to hit the middle ground. Well, totally. I don't know how many teams have been able to do it. Like Steve Kerr, like comes a little bit from like that Spurs, Greg Popovich, like background. I wonder if he saw like, Oh yeah. Like, you know, they directly went into like the Kawhi Leonard, you know, era to transition out of the Tim Duncan, Manu Ginobili, uh, Tony Parker era. And that was set up to be fine. And, Till they like fucked up whatever they fucked up like with his injury situation yep. so i say all this to say like there are so few examples of this working throughout history being able to hit that middle ground and i think it, it's like a little bit of a hubristic decision to try and hit it because on another level i actually really agree with you on your point of like standing with jonathan kaminga on this because if i was jonathan kaminga i'd be fucking pissed I have I'm I'm extension eligible this summer. Yes. I'm a top seven pick just two years ago or whatever. I've played well this year. I'm trying to get paid. Those priorities are a really important factor to players. I'd be furious if I was Jonathan Kaminga. I get it. I, I think he is completely reasonable in his frustration. I think it's fucking crazy to go to Shams <laughs> like a day after Shams and Slater. I have, I have a question. <laughs> Do you think that this happens like more often and that because like if I got a message from a player like that after a game, I probably am working on like reporting a wider story or something like that. Like my my position in media would be different and it would create a different set of actions for me. Whereas if you go to Sham, Sham, sorry, he's like, it's immediately it's coming out. You know, it's like. Is there any responsibility you think on Shams to like vet this stuff, wait it out, or just like, oh, uh, it's out there? I, I would bet you, uh, knowing Shams, I would bet you he vetted this pretty strong. Oh, sorry, sorry I don't the, mean, I don't mean the fact vet. that, yeah, yeah. but but particularly the fact that Slater is also bylined on the story. Um, Slater is as connected sure. with that Golden State situation as anybody. There's, yeah, like I, I totally get what you're saying in terms of like, should it be like a deeper dive? Why is Jonathan Kaminga upset, et cetera, et cetera? Um, I think this one, you can do the news first, which is that Jonathan Kaminga is upset. Get that out. And then like if Slater wants to do the deep dive on it and like sure. do exactly what you're saying, like that's where you can do that basically. Yeah. Um, but like, look, I don't really get into those worlds because like I don't love doing it. So like yeah, you, I'm you not... and I don't don't uh, we our job despite being like the same is different. Yeah. 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 No, it is. Um okay. So any thoughts on what I said beyond that though? Yeah. Just to hammer it home, it's I like Draymond can say he has he's having a tough time extending all of branches, but you're the guy who's made 150 million dollars. You know that when a guy comes into the league, I understand players want to win. Evident, ev like evidenced by how much they work on their craft, their improvement over time. Like players work like crazy nowadays. Um, they want to get the bag, though. A sure, like generational wealth for your family, yourself, and everything else. And Kuminga, if he feels like he's kind of being jerked around, frustration, obviously, because it's it's money. It's tangible loss of wealth over like an X amount of years time when the coach is like doing this kind of stuff. And he doesn't even get to like Kerr doesn't even get to appeal to we're winning. That's that's the thing. Like there what yeah. higher ideal are you serving and what higher ideal are you sacrificing for? If you're Kuminga, if the team's losing all the same and you're losing minutes to people who they've been paid, they get paid and you think like respectably you think i can provide more impact and this can more tangibly affect my career earnings going forward and this is my job all of those things intersecting put me on the side of like i understand why kaminga says this and i understand why moses moody is frustrated i understand why there's been frustration from like a myriad of players when it comes to the warriors 
Yeah, like Moses Moody, by the way, earlier today, like Jason Dumas reported, uh, the people around Moses are frustrated with the lack of a role and consistency. He's, by the way, he's the one that specifically I think should be furious, even above Kaminga. Like, he's the one that falls out of the rotation every time. Every single time, it seems like. He's the one that gets yanked around, gets pulled around, gets, you know, thrown uh, onto the bench when they need a minute or they need to shorten the rotation or whatever. Look, to me, this ends with the Warriors having to make a real decision. Do we want the kids or like, you know, Steve Kerr, like I, I believe he like didn't sign an extension this summer. So do we decide that we want to retain Steve Kerr into the long term and move on that way? Or you're hitting a breaking point with these two eras. Totally. I would bet you that just given that Stephen Curry still exists and is still unbelievable at basketball. I would bet you that the end result here is that they probably choose Stephen Curry and choose the old guard. Cause that tends to be how this works. And frankly, like I think Jonathan Kaminga is a really interesting young player. I think Moses Moody is a really interesting young player. Neither of them have emerged into like star players. Yeah. Well, that's, that's either. the thing too, is that like when we talked about Kawhi, Kawhi made that evident. The, the, yeah. the Spurs didn't have to be like thoughtful or mindful about their pivot. Kawhi showed up and won a finals MVP. And they said, Ooh, this is like super opportunistic. And they didn't go out of their way to position like a younger timeline. They just kept going along. And yeah. like, this is the thing about development too. And like all that kind of stuff. The Raptors were like this to some degree too, is the Raptors. Everybody said that that organization developed Fred Van Vliet and Pascal Siakam and OG Ananobi and all these late first rounders and undrafted guys and second rounders like Norm Powell. It's like they deserve credit for putting them in roles. But the biggest thing is identifying them as guys who had latent talent to become that. Like if you don't draft Pascal Siakam, if you draft like Scala Bissier instead of Pascal, right? It doesn't matter how good your organization is at development. He's not going to be a two-time All-NBA player. He's not going to get a max contract, most likely. And yeah. the Warriors being like, we're super mindful about these two timelines. It doesn't matter if you're mindful about it or like you're approaching it from this high-level aspect. Like, okay, we can plan it out this way. You got to get the guys who make that an easy transition, who make that palatable. And yeah. those guys haven't made it as palatable as other people have on other teams in the past. That's, I yeah. think that's my full take. 